Theater Corner is brought to you by Amazing Grace Conservatory. And by Central San Diego Black Chamber of Commerce, The Mental Bar, Jones, Del Cerro Tax, The Westgate Hotel, La Jolla Playhouse, and viewers like you, thank you. Hi, welcome to Theater Corner. I'm your host, Michael Taylor. As a lifelong theater enthusiast and a board member for one of the top theaters in the country, I've seen firsthand the positive effects that diversity and inclusion can have on the stage and the theater seats. This interview series was created to share my passion for theater and promote diverse voices throughout the national theater scene. We sit down with some of the top professionals in the entertainment industry to discuss training, careers, advice for young actors, and how to make theater matter to more people. Today I talked to the person assigned as artistic director of the Lorraine Hansberry Theater, Margot Hall. You will hear her response to receiving a $100,000 fellowship how she overcame hurdles of being a black woman in the industry, and how she uses motherhood to tap into emotions for roles. So, silence your cell phones, folks. You're entering Theater Corner. You really couldn't find an apartment? The whole damn city got a for rent sign on it. Have you ever been convicted of a felony? If so, what is the nature of your crime? Well, whose fault is that? Damn. Well, I just assumed you'd only be here for a little bit. And eventually, you and Val were. Mom, mom. She came by a couple days ago. We are not together right now. OK. 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 Well, Jimmy and all my drums are in guest room A now. Yeah, I saw that. Clear the rest of Sinead's stuff off her old bed, and you can have that room for a bit. But that is not your room. That is my guest room B. Margot Hall, yeah. welcome to Theater <laughs> Corner. It's so nice to, to be in the, in the same space with you and to finally say congratulations face to face for being uh, assigned uh, the artistic director of Lorraine Hansberry Theater. Yes. So what is, what is that like? Oh, wow. Uh, first, let me just say thank you so much for inviting me to the Theater Corner. It's <laughs> been such a pleasure watching you over the years and mm. everything that you've developed. And so I'm finally here, and <laughs> it's, it's just really great to be here. Ah, Lorraine Hansberry Theater. It is a joy. It is a true joy to finally uh, plant my feet in a different space. Mm. And now, as opposed to being on the stage, I am producing what's on the stage. Okay. Um, and to take that step at this point in my career, I think it's, it's just what was meant for me, the next step. And they had asked me time and time before mm -hmm. if I wanted to take that on, and I wasn't ready yet. You know, I had a huge freelance career um, over the years, and I was running here and doing that, and I just said, I'm not ready to settle down. Because once you take that on, that's mm -hmm. a big responsibility. True. Especially a theater named Lorraine Hansberry <laughs> Theater. So, um, so mm -hmm. when I finally made that decision, I was ready. I was truly ready. So you mentioned uh, your, you know, your dedication to, you know, theater and arts and mm -hmm. and and Northern California for. Upwards of uh, three, three decades. Yeah. And so you were finally recognized mm -hmm. for that with the yeah. uh, Kenneth Raynan Fellowship. Yes. Tell me about this fellow. I mean, this is huge. It's actually. huge. Yeah, it was, uh, it was a surprise. So you are nominated within your community mm -hmm. to apply for the fellowship. So when they called me, I was like, 
a hundred thousand dollars <laughs> unrestricted funds. Unre unrestricted. Unrestricted. <laughs> so I was like, wow. Okay. So then I called all the people I know who could help me write. <laughs> I was like, we got to get this together. Mainly my two sisters. Uh -huh. And the beauty of the fellowship is it is for being an anchor artist in my community. And for me, I was being recognized for dedicating myself to the Bay Area. A lot of my friends have gone on and they're in television and Hollywood. I mean, right. I do a little of that. We'll get into that. <laughs> but I kind of dedicated myself to that community. I teach at UC Berkeley and at a community college, Chabot College. I've been at Chabot for 20 years, mm -hmm. been at UC Berkeley about eight years. Um, and I just dedicated myself to my mentees in the community, working at all of the local theaters uh -huh. as a director, actor, and playwright. And so someone recognized that and they said, we want to applaud you for that. And it made me really have to sit down and say, I'm worth it. Right, because you are. And that was a bit more than an applause. I think that was a standing ovation, $100,000. Yes. yes. <laughs> so what is it like to be an actor from Detroit, mm -hmm. to play a role in a theater piece about Detroit, and oh. I'm talking about Skeleton Crew. Yes. <laughs> yes. And this is a piece written by a playwright from Detroit. I mean, you had to just be... Oh. I, was, I had been waiting to do that play. Oh. It was one of the best experiences ever because Dominique Morso's words just fall out of my mouth. They fit perfectly. And I just knew that was my aunt, my mother, mm. my sisters. Yeah, right. I mean, that character, my most of my family worked in the car, you know, oh. they were workers. They, I had two aunts who were foremans for Chrysler. Um, so it, it was just my life. It was my world. It was my language. Uh -huh. um, and I love that play. I love every <laughs> time I got to step on that stage and speak those words, Faye, ugh, oh, I miss her. And it was something different, you mm -hmm. know? Uh, and uh, sometimes people see me as, kind of the, 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 you know, very hard actress or yeah. kind of glamorous kind. Yeah. And I got to like throw my hair in a ponytail. <laughs> I was like, no, we come in Detroit up in here. I'm smoking cigarettes. Put on some boots. That's right. Have my boots on. <laughs> oh man, that character. Uh, yeah, it was fantastic. I've been trying to fight the excitement because now we're going to get to Pixar, <laughs> oh, the, yes. the, the film Soul. <laughs> <laughs> were, were you you were uh, the voice of Melba? Yes. Now that had to be exciting. Oh, that was so much fun. Um, Melba is so cute, and the, <laughs> it was so cute to see what she looked like. And uh, I was like, yes, that's the voice. I that's what I pictured when I made <laughs> Melba's little voice. It was so much fun because. You know, I have so much going on, and it was a breath of fresh air to do something different. I've mm. worked a few times with Pixar and other projects, but nothing as large mm. as the movie Soul. And I knew the movie was going to be spectacular. But even when I auditioned for it, I didn't know Jamie Foxx was in it and Felicia <laughs> Rashad and Angela Bassett. I had no idea, right? I was like, oh, this is cute. You know, Pixar is 15 minutes from my house. Let me run in and uh, <laughs> do this right quick. <laughs> and then I didn't even know the guy who was directing me was the, the writer who wrote uh, inside out and up, and I was like, oh, hey, how you doing, right? Incredible. And then somebody was like, you know, so-and-so. I was like, oh, okay, good. And mm -hmm. then it was very special to share that. I think it came out at Christmas time or yeah, yeah, a I holiday. Yeah, something like, yeah, yeah. One of those holidays, and my son was with me. So I was like, you know, sometimes I'll surprise my friends, and they'll say, I was like, have you seen the movie Soul? And they're like, oh, I love that film. And I was like, oh, yeah, I was Melba. You were little Melba? So that's always fun. There's another film, uh, Blind Spotting. Yes. Which actually evolved into a TV series yes. uh, that you're on. And you play Nancy. Yes, I play Nancy. I say Davi Diggs' mom. <laughs> yeah, so the film came about because I've known Davi Diggs and Raphael Casal for many, many years. Mm -hmm. um, I 
founded a theater company called Campo Santo about over 20 five years ago, maybe. Uh -huh. And David used to work with us. And so I've played David's mother, sister, cousin. <laughs> uh, and so that's how we got to know each other. And we've just been friends for a long time. And he and Raphael kept saying, we're going to write this movie and we're going to be movers. We're going to be movers. And I was like, <laughs> okay, sounds good. Let me know. And then they did it. And they were like, no, it's happening. <laughs> and, uh, and I've just been so proud of them. It was so much fun. We were in Oakland. It was just such a tribute to Oakland and the wonderful people and the culture uh -huh. of Oakland. And so we did that. And then next thing I knew, they were like, so now it's going to be a TV show. <laughs> and you're going to be Nancy again. And I was like, OK, let me know. And then that happened. Wow. It is a fantastic show. It is so, so beautifully made and done. It's so artistic. Uh -huh. if, if anyone has not seen it, you have to see it. And I'm not just saying it because I'm in it, but it's so fresh and new. They have employed dancers from Oakland that are throughout the piece. Uh -huh. yeah, um, yeah. There's spoken word right, right. and rap. That's what they do. Mm -hmm. And so every every show has some spoken word and just so inventive. And knowing how close you guys are and, and watching this, I'm, I'm thinking that there is a good bit of improv. Yes, yes. Yeah. I get a little nervous, though, because, you know, I'm not as seasoned as some of these other actors. And they'll just go off, and they're so funny, because it's a funny show, right? Right, right? Dealing with some deep issues, yeah. but it's funny. And they'll just start improv and then I'm like, oh, God, they're going to ask me to do something. <laughs> so I'll say something, and they'll be like, okay, never mind. <laughs> no, no. So we do. We kind of riff a little, of course. Of course, yeah. It's such a talented crew and cast. And then you're also on a piece on Netflix, All Day and a Night. Yes. A little bit more serious. Uh... Oh, yeah. It is a really intense show dealing with, actually, similar to Blind Spotting, right. about incarceration, mm. you know? And I had, I basically kind of opened the movie. Um, and in that particular film, my daughter has been killed by the person who is in court. And he's being, you know, tried for murder. Mm -hmm. And I get to speak on her behalf. So it's a really powerful moment at the right. opening of this film. <laughs> um, and it was, a, you know, it was a challenge because that kind of stuff, you have to just be ready. You uh -huh. have to be ready. I mean, it's different from theater. Theater, you have four weeks to rehearse <laughs> and develop your right. character and <laughs> find your motivation. Uh, right. And you walk in on the set and they go, okay, you ready? Okay, <laughs> go. He killed your daughter. Go. Oh, geez. And, you know, <laughs> the first line, I think, was, I hope you rot in hell. And wow. you got to embody that line. Mm -hmm. And it needs to come from your toes. You, you really are able to strike incredible authenticity mm. uh, with, your, with your characters. And that's about, to me, it seems like you need to be able to get the actor out of the way so mm -hmm. that the character can can be. Can come through. You yes. know, what, what are your, yeah. what is your, kind of your approach to that? Because you're, you're, you can strike that. Uh, yeah, yeah. I just, I think I know how important it is to tell somebody's story. Mm. And you can't play with that. Right. You know, if you commit to doing something, you have to go there. You have to go deep. You have to do your research. Mm -hmm. You have to make sure that you are telling their story. And that requires you, like you say, to get out of the way. Uh. Um, and also to be able to embody someone fully. Uh, not just, uh, I'm a mother who's upset, but this is a mother who has lost her child. Right. I have a child. Mm. All I have to do is think <laughs> about my child, uh -huh. and it's, there's no there's no acting. And so tapping into that is it's 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 something you need. It's something you need to do. And I teach workshops on stuff like that. How do you find your authentic self? Uh -huh. It's so important when you're an artist to know who you are. Philip Andre Botello shares with us his passion for the arts and how his access to formalized training contributes to his expert technique. In this conversation, we learn about his mixed heritage and how his teachers let him know early on that being a person of color meant he must work harder than his white peers. I'm Kenneth, what's your name? Casey. 
I'm glad you chose karate, Casey. It's an excellent martial art and will likely change your life. Would you like to go first? Maybe you should go first. <sighs> okay. Ice! Ah! <gasps> <gasps> Not in the day class. I'm sorry, Sate. I forgot where I was. It was an accident. You all right? <laughs> Welcome to Theater Corner, brother. So exciting to have you here. You know, we're based in San Diego, but actually you're from San Diego. I spent a lot of my informative years here. Mm. Um, a lot of my training started here at some really great places, so I'm a San Diego kid. <laughs> All right, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned training because your your training has been sort of exact. You know, you've got, you've got the premier training track. Uh, tell us about that, because it actually started Back in high school, perhaps? Yes, uh, it started back in high school. I attended uh, what's called COSA, or the Coronado School of the Arts mm. in Coronado. Um, it's an arts program, and um, I was fortunate enough to get in. Um, I have to thank my mom, who, um, she's a teacher herself and she champions teachers. She mm. saw that I had a certain need and I, I was yearning for something, <laughs> and she gave me access to this place. And um, you know, I, I don't want to quote other people, but you know, Jay Z, uh, he always says, "What's the difference between like him and Bill Gates?" And it's access. You know, if uh, he had access to a computer when he was a kid, he might be doing something else. So I really appreciate my mom and, and my stepfather because they saw that I I had this need for something, right. and instead of like some parents, they they might say, "No, no, no, you got to stay in this school and do what you're supposed to." My mom said. It seems like you're kind of leaning in a certain way, so why don't I make something available for you mm. to have it and see what happens? And I just ate it up. You went to Juilliard from, from there. Yeah, you know, at the time you learn more about it and um, it's like very low acceptance rate. I think at the time it was like a 1%. Wow. Now now it's like 2 or 3%. But <laughs> it's like 2 2 Yeah. <laughs> but um, it was tough and it was one of those kind of places where um, I learned about it, but even if I mentioned it to someone like, they're saying, what are, you, what are you thinking about after go, after Coronado? I'd say, well, I think about Julia. They're like, woof, don't even try. Mm. And they would say, hey, I don't know you, but, and you know, they'd always preference it with like, they only take the cream of the crop, mm. or they're only, so I was like, oh, well now I have to go. Yeah, and, and, and you never know until you you put it out there and try. That's mm -hmm. that's that's the other important lesson. But you were, you were there, you were accepted, and you are mm -hmm. there training, but you're there training as a person of color. Tell yeah. me about that that experience uh, in that context. I know things have changed now, but when I, so being as a young kid, I thought that me being, because I'm mixed, you know, my father is from, uh, he's Mexican, he's from Michoacan, mm. and my mom's African American, mm. and together they make me. <laughs> but um, I thought that I would have more of a chance. And I learned at that time, when I was applying from some uh, my teachers who were also of color, they said, hey, actually, um, it's gonna be harder. In the acting program, they only accept 20 people. So out of all these, they only accept 20. That's the freshman class. Wow. And um, most of those people at that time were Caucasian. Mm. Um, and there was maybe one Hispanic or one African American. Mm. So my teacher was trying to let me know, like, it's going to be harder for you. She's like, when you get in that room, in the audition room on that day, you're going to be competing with everyone. But if there's anyone that kind of looks like you, you got to beat them out. Mm. Um, Interesting. And I remember, um, and I know, isn't that so, it's such a bad <laughs> thing, but I remember being in the audition room and seeing everybody, and I'm like, okay, these guys are my competition, but also, if there's anybody that looks like me, and there were some people, and I'm like, all right, so, you know, because they weren't going to accept both of us. Right, right, and right, right. Unfortunately, I think there was like, on my day, in my block, there was like 100, there were some people of color, mm. and um, I didn't see any of those people in the action program. Now, when wow. I got in the program, there were other, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, um, which was good, but it wasn't enough. And I know that program has since changed because um, people like Anthony Mackie, who, when I went to the school, he showed me around, he really fought for like getting August Wilson and these plays, people mm. of color to do um, Hispanic. Uh, so. It's changed a lot, and um, the classrooms reflect that. Um, so I think what coming in, I was just kind of like on the cusp of that when they were starting to get a little more, a little more hip, a little, uh, more, <laughs> a little more cool. But that's a, that's a great question. And, and what I'm hearing and understanding is is that, uh, brother, you you were the competition. <laughs> so so <laughs> you phrase it how you want to phrase it. Yeah, and I'll let you know what it, what's what's really what's up. That's starting your your foundation of stage. 
Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and and then you obviously transition to to film, and mm -hmm. you you've done tons of film. Yeah. So where where does where does the stage? I know you know maybe that's nostalgic for you now. You, you've <laughs> done so much film, mm -hmm. but uh, what what do you think it is? Uh, you know the difference between stage and film, and 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 what's your preference? Yeah. What's the, what's the different experience like for you? Me being immersed in theater and getting this theater foundation was everything. It's so demanding. Mm. When, you, when you're doing things like, you know, plays like August Wilson oh, yeah. and, uh, and Shakespeare, right. it takes everything. And um, their kind of model at that school is like, if you can do the classics, then you can do anything. It really stretches your, uh, your powers as an actor and you, you see what you can do. Um, the difference between uh, stage and film, the mechanics are they're both are the same because mm. at the end of the day, you're trying to be truthful. Right. And it applies both. And the difference is you might have an audience and there's a hundred seats and you might project. Right. And, uh, and then the camera is just right in front of your face. I'm gonna quote somebody else who says it perfectly. He <laughs> says, um, doing theater is like doing surgery with a scalpel. You have to be so precise. But doing film is like doing surgery with a laser. Mm. Because it's picking up your thoughts. Uh. And actually, I found that if you, doing Shakespeare on film, much more easier than doing it on stage. Right, right. Because, you know, it's always like a, a dialogue with the, with, the, with the person that, you know. Well, there's the opportunity to cut and start, start all <laughs> yeah, over. 100%. I mean, you're on the spot uh, yeah. on stage. I mean, you got to be spot on. You got to be spot on. And it's you're in the moment, on the day. Mm. And if you mess up, you mess up. So you get a good foundation about being prepared, showing up ready. So uh, I think that's really helped me in my film work because... I don't need a lot of takes. Like I'm, re I'm ready to mm, go, um, right. and it's all from that training. Sometimes younger actors was like, "What advice can you give me about preparation?" And I always say, um, "You can do as the actor uh, whatever you want to prepare, as long as it one, it doesn't hurt anybody on the crew, and two, it doesn't eat up time." Mm. So if I'm waiting for you to prepare on the day, like right before a scene, I'm like, some people are okay with that, but it eats up time. So just do your work, and you learn all that from the theater preparation in that background. You gotta show up prepared. You have to be off book, you have to know. Right. So it's it's helped me out because a lot of people, that's why I get rehired is people like, <laughs> he'll be ready. You started in a film <laughs> called <laughs> the, the 11th Order mm -hmm. and where you play a Marine. And, and this is a true story. True story. So, you know, I'm a Marine Corps veteran. So that, that particular film really grabbed me. Tell me about that. So it's about these two actual Marines who uh, sacrificed their life um, for their whole team. Um, it's a great, it's a wonderful cast. I was so uh, thrilled and, because it felt authentic and that's what I told him, um, you know, when I auditioned and I sent my tape and I said, hey, I don't, I don't know if you know anything about the Marines or in being in the Army, but it feels real and mm. the director was, um, you know, a Marine. Right. Um, but it was a great experience. We were at this um, film festival and it was a very, uh, uh, you know, a lot of the population, it was a military in town. And um, uh, we screened this film and it was silent. Mm. And then it got a standing ovation for, I don't know, 15 minutes or something. People were just wow. clapping and they had tears in their eyes. And um, the host was actually, he served as well. Mm. And we were on stage and he started the questions and he stopped, he just started weeping. Wow. And he was like, I'm sorry, it really affected me. And you see something like that and you're like, okay, well this is not, it's bigger than me. And so in that film, you you saved the lives of uh, your unit, mm -hmm. but uh, tell me about how theater and acting actually saved, saved your life. I didn't know this until about maybe three months ago, but um, I had just gotten into this program, um, Coronado School of the Arts, and I lived in La Mesa, so I didn't go to the current school anymore, but mm -hmm. I still had friends that were going to this program, and they didn't see me because, you know, I, I'd get out of school at like 7 p.m., and then I'd come home and I'd be tired. So my friend one day who was just really, really hounding me and saying, listen, you've changed. You, you know, you think you're this fancy pants. Um, just hang out with us once. And I said, okay. So uh, we went down to the corner in La Mesa. And, you know, meanwhile, I'm um, new in this program, only person of color, really. And I just got into this play called The Good Doctor. And I was trying to tell him, like, I've got so many lines and I, I need to be off book mm -hmm. by tomorrow and blah, blah, blah. So he, he said he doesn't, he didn't care. Uh, so we're waiting and he said, our other friend's gonna join us. So I'm on the corner of La Mesa and for whatever reason, I just, I said, you know what? 
I have to go. And I left. And the next day I showed up and I was off book. Now, me and that friend, we fell out for years. And after that day, I didn't talk to him. We reconnected maybe about a year ago. Three months ago, he said, he said, Philip, I never told you this, but um, you know, when you got in that program, we could all see a change. You just got focused. But do you remember that day I asked you to hang out on the corner? And I said, yeah. He said, 10 minutes after you left, our other friend came. I got in a car with that guy. They went like two blocks, got stopped by the police. And it turns out that car was stolen. Wow. And not only was it stolen, there was like stuff in the trunk. Wow. My friend didn't know, but he said, that's the first night he went to juvenile hall. Wow. And he said, if you were to just would have been there with us, that would have been your first night in juvenile hall. So when I'm saying that theater saved my life and it kept me out of trouble, it literally did. Mm. And I just learned this information three months ago. Incredible. Yeah. We're good. You're here. Yeah, I'm here. <laughs> yeah. It's all because of this play, The Good Doctor, that I was right. in, that I, I needed to have my lines down. <laughs> Incredible. Yeah. If you don't know, now you know. This work is not for the faint at heart. It takes hard work, dedication, and a respect for the craft. Two extraordinary conversations today. That concludes another episode of Theater Corner, and we'll see you next time. Support for this program comes from the KPBS Explore Local Content Fund, supporting new ideas and programs for San Diego.